Hey, this is Troy Harrison from the Secrets of Scale podcast. Today, I've got a really cool episode. I'm actually bringing on two people with me. The first one I've known since January 2022. I brought him on my team. He's crushing it as an email list manager. A lot of people were asking me like, hey, can you have some of your team members on an interview sometime and finally doing it? So all the way from Los Angeles, California, we have Ian Scott. Yeah, I'm uh, super lucky to be here. I met Troy actually last summer at uh, Stephen Georgie's house. Um, it was funny when I told Troy, he didn't remember, but then he remembered. He hired me and uh, he was gracious enough to let me move into his home without knowing me. And yeah, it's, it's living the dream out here and I love it. Troy's great. And Travis, yeah, I work with Travis now too, which is awesome. He's the other guest. All right. So thank you for that. Um, it, it's been a great year so far, that's for sure. Our second guest um, is somebody that I've known since earlier this year through the 100 Million Mastermind. He's a door-to-door -door salesman turned founder, investor, speaker, and most known as a podcaster. He is the founder of Guestio.com, which I am a client of, and they helped me get on a lot of different podcasts, and it's been amazing so far. And he's also done this for people like Shaquille O'Neal, Rob Deerdeck, Grant Cardone, Josh Peck, Molly Bloom, Jasmine Starr, John Maxwell, and literally hundreds of other people that he's putting on uh, podcasts or interviewing himself. Um, he's also been featured in Forbes, Entrepreneur, TechCrunch, Bloomberg, and literally dozens of other media outlets. He's coming in all the way from Vegas, and it's Travis Chappelle. Hey, hey, what's up, guys? What's going on? Happy to be here. Yeah, thanks, Travis. So um, first of all, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, your upbringing, and how you got into entrepreneurship? Sure. Yeah, so grew up extremely religious uh, in a small town in Southern California called Lancaster, which is kind of an odd place to have like a big religious community, but um, it, it was that way. Uh, grew up, uh, I tell people it's like a bubble uh, because I graduated kindergarten on the same campus that I graduated uh, middle school, high school, and college on, uh, which was also the same campus I went to church on. So it was like pretty much seven days a week because we had Saturday soul winning. So soul winning was our like uh, basically go knock doors and invite people to come to church on Sunday. So we're basically there seven days a week from the time that I was like, you know, I, I, we started going to church there when I was three. I was enrolled in kindergarten at five. So all the way up till the time I graduated college and left, which was 21, uh, 22. And so in that cultural context, the the college that was on that campus was obviously not a big college. Uh, it was the, the biggest it ever was, was the year that I was graduating or my freshman or sophomore year. There was almost a thousand students. Um, the high school was like, or the entire school K through 12 was like, you know, 400 or something. We had the largest class to ever graduate from the school, I think still even to this day. And we had like 40 people in our in our class um and so the really the only thing that, that was available at the college was ministerial degrees that was the only reason it existed it was purely ministerial there were like 12 majors to choose from and they were all something to do with ministry um so i had committed to be in ministry when i was 12 so uh that was the college i ended up going to by the time i graduated i realized i didn't want to be in ministry and uh basically was like okay i probably should have figured this out like freshman year but now i'm figuring it out senior year and i was also getting married so i was getting married to my high school sweetheart i was graduating college and figuring out the thing that i was planning on doing to support my new wife and myself was something i didn't want to do and at that point i didn't really know what to do i, I didn't you know you don't you don't get a lot of job offers lining up at the door when you have an unaccredited degree in bible and church ministries uh and so i was like well i can go get some base level corporate job for 25 35 grand a year and take three decades to work my way up to making a six-figure salary at some point or i do the thing that i've done in college to make extra money because i'm pretty good at it which was door-to-door -door sales so i started in door-to-door -door, um full-time i was doing it in college but i did full-time uh when i left college uh selling alarm systems up in central valley california in fresno um, and then, uh, yeah, so I sold solar before that, sold alarms, sold water purification. And then basically, uh, the first year I made six figures was like, it was cool because I, it was like a big goal of mine to hit six figures. And I was focused on that goal. But once I hit the goal, I was like, okay, what, what now? So I was like 23 at the time, I think 20, 22 or 23, I just cracked six figures, my first full-time year in door to door, hundred percent commission sales. And I was looking at it. I was like, well, this is cool for now, but I don't know if I want to be doing this when I'm 33 or when I'm 43 or when I'm 53, 
and I know I don't want to be in ministry. So what do I do now? Cause now I'm basically like rock bottom type of a point. Cause I don't, I don't want to do the thing that I'm qualified to do with my degree. And I don't want to do the thing that I know how to do that. I've the only thing I have experience in, which is door to door. And uh, so I try to apply for all these corporate sales jobs and stuff. Nobody would hire me, I think maybe too inexperienced or too young or something, but it blew my mind at the time. I was like, look, I'm out producing everybody like hundred percent commission door to door. And like, you guys are talking about company car and salary and like leads and stuff. Like you're going to give me leads. Like, yes. Like put, put me in coach. You know what I mean? But nobody would hire me. So I, uh, I was just kind of sitting there kind of sulking a little bit and the only thing I knew what to do at the time was just dive into personal development. And it was the first time in my life I had really done it because I was choosing to do it for myself. And so picked up some books, um, listened to some audio books and finally came across podcasts and was just an avid listener. I which really enjoyed the medium. Uh, I, I liked how conversational it was, yet still educational. And so I started listening to a ton of podcasts and came across a few that were in the entrepreneurial space. This one podcast in particular with John Lee Dumas, he was talking about his free course to learn how to podcast. And I was like, oh, I'll go take that. So I take the course and basically start my show. And at the time I was still doing door to door uh, to kind of pay the bills and re really, frankly, fund my, um, you know, podcast dreams or desires or whatever. It was just, it was a, it was a pretty good job for that because I could go knock doors for two weeks and make 15, 20 grand knocking doors and then come back, work on the podcast, invest in myself, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I uh, started doing that podcast finally started going well, moved into coaching and consulting people on starting podcasts um, and then found that entrepreneurs were really interested in that world. And so started coaching entrepreneurs on how to podcast successfully. We started producing shows. I built a course and community and then through all of that, basically, we came across this idea for Guestio because everybody I got in contact with, whether they're a private client or they were a, um, a course student, they all had the same problem. How do I go find good guests and how do I get booked on shows to grow my show? And there was not really a great solution for that at the time, except for hiring an agency, which can get really expensive um, or taking a year and a half of time to build a bank up of credible guests so that it makes it easier for you to go get good guests. There was no like shortcut. And so Guestio kind of became that shortcut. So we launched Guestio um, and then ended up starting the agency um, at the beginning of this year, which is, uh, which is what you're in, uh, uh, you're in Troy, obviously, is, is, is the agency side where we do everything that the software does, but we do it on a done for you basis uh, for people that have more money than they have time. Uh, so I tell people like, if you have more time than money, then do the software. If you have more money than time, then hire us uh, done for you like love service. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's, that's the 30,000 foot view from college all the way up to now. Yeah, that's a cool perspective because it seems like everybody has some wild, weird journey that <laughs> we have no idea how it ended up the way it is today, but it worked out. Um, so when you were starting your podcast, uh, the million dollar question for somebody who's listening and they want to start a podcast, what are some of those things that you did early on to grow it long before Guestio was a thing? I mean, early on, it didn't grow. <laughs> you know, like I, it just wasn't, it wasn't doing much. I mean, it would grow very incrementally. Um, but I did, uh, I did do a couple of things to, to try to do that. I mean, I was getting myself booked on other podcasts. Um, and then I was joining a lot of Facebook groups around the topic that I was talking about. And then, uh, and then I would op optimize my Facebook profile. And so I put like a cover photo on that was like an advertisement for my podcast. And then my bio was something about my podcast. The link that I had my bio was for my podcast. And then I would engage a lot in a lot of these Facebook groups um, that were in, like I said, mid the niche that I was interested in being in. And, uh, and so when people would come in and engage on my posts inside of those groups, I would add them as friends. They would inevitably come to my profile and then they would see, you know, the podcast. So we, like I said, we were growing, but it was very incremental, very, very slow. Um, you know, within a year, we were probably six to 800 downloads an episode or something like that, which most shows will never make it past 200 downloads an episode. So it's not like I was upset about that in that context, but I also was hoping for more like 10,000 an episode. Um, so it was obviously not as good as I was hoping for, but, um, and then uh, one of the other things I did too, was like, there's just different podcast platforms out there that exist that are outside of Spotify and Apple podcasts 
um, that are just like, they're smaller media players, but smaller still means they have millions of users. They don't have hundreds of millions of users, but they have millions still. Um, and so uh, what I would do is I would go see if I could create a partnership with them where I advertise their podcast player to my audience. And then they would give me, uh, you know, uh, uh, ranking on their homepage of their discovery uh, section, you know, there was like editors picks or whatever is like, oh, my show's right there because I did a full week drop of like uh, free advertising for them and things like that. So there's things you can do to get pretty creative, but even with those, like those things are just going to grow your show like very, very, very slowly, like snail slowly. Um, but, you know, for some people that works and maybe that's all you're trying to accomplish. So hopefully that helps. Yeah, that's amazing. Now, would you say that, um, your, your life in door-to-door -door sales helped you basically do online door-to-door -door sales in terms of selling yourself, getting on podcasts. Like what are some of the things that carried over? Yeah, absolutely, man. I, I mean, I don't think you can separate anything that I've done from the door-to-door -door experience that I had. Um, because I mean, it's, it's one of the most difficult ways to cut your teeth in sales is, is going door-to-door hundred -door, percent commission, no leads. They're not expecting you to show up. You knock the door, and when I was selling alarms in particular, like the solar and water purification were, two, well, we would say, you know, two knock closes where you knock the first time, set an appointment, come back and then close the, on the second appointment. Alarms were like one knock close. So you knock the door and then in like less than an hour, you're signing contracts. And then in less than an hour after that, it's getting installed. So that type of, that type of um, uh, repetition uh, over a period of time was just like, you know, invaluable in terms of, in terms of what I was able to take away from it. But the biggest thing is just handling rejection. Uh, there's a guy named Guy, Guy Ross, who is the host of a podcast called How I Built This. Massive show. I don't even know how many downloads they get, but it's millions. They've had hundreds of millions, if not billions in total at this point. And Guy talks to some of the most uh, successful founders uh, that are out there. Some of the most successful company founders that are out there. It's an NPR show. And Guy wrote a book called How I Built This that went along with the show and was kind of like, here's the top things that we learned from talking to all of the amazing founders we talked to. And when Guy was doing the promotion of that book, he went on this podcast tour and went on a bunch of different people's shows. So I listened to several, uh, several of the interviews that he did on other people's shows uh, just because I'd never heard him interviewed. I'd only heard him interview. And so I was like, I want to check out a few of these interviews. And so one of the questions that they would ask people, one the people would inevitably ask him, and I, it was probably on a list of questions that they wanted him to ask. And I'm sure he covers it in the book. I never read it, full disclosure. But uh, one of the things he talks about was people would ask him all the time, what's like the common denominator of all of the successful people, successful people you've talked to? What's like the biggest common denominator? And, you know, a lot of people are expecting something like, you know, whatever, ambition or leadership or sales or something more practical like that. But what he said was um, every person I've ever talked to has had an amazing ability to overcome rejection. That was his answer on multiple shows, not just one. Like he said it multiple. That's why I said it. Like I listened to multiple of them. He would get asked that question and he would say that every time. And that was the biggest common denominator that he's seen between people who are starting companies that are, you know, Silicon Valley's unicorns and even companies that have been public after that. So companies with tens of billions of dollars in market cap. And he was like the common denominator, overcoming rejection. That's it. It's the ability to stick in the game longer than most people are willing to stick in the game to develop the calluses. And it reminds me of playing the guitar, man. Cause when I first started learning to play the guitar in my fingers, would hurt. I would strum. It'd be buzzing. Like the um, they're on the they're on the you know fret wrong. Like everything felt bad. It felt weird. I literally told myself at the time. This is when I was in high school. I was like, maybe I'm just a, not meant to play the guitar because it it would it just sucked. It did, it wasn't fun. It didn't sound good. It it hurt. Nothing was good about it. But then like after a couple of months, you develop these little things on your fingers called calluses. And then the calluses make it easier to press down the strings. And then it, it also means it doesn't hurt anymore. And now you can switch to a chord and you can strum that chord. And then you can switch to another one and strum that one. And then it's like, oh, it's actually starting to sound a little bit like music right here. The problem is most people won't stick through the pain of building the calluses to get to where it starts getting fun because you've actually built some sort of a skill set. And that applies ac across the board to whatever it is that you're working on. And the rejection is the calluses that you're going to get. And is it painful to go get it? Yes. Does it feel good? No. 
But at the end of the day, if you really want to learn to play guitar, you're going to have to push through the calluses. You're going to have to get them. You're going to have to go through the pain. It's part of the process. And so with door to door, man, I mean, that was the biggest thing is that it taught me how to deal with and handle rejection, uh, which something, which is something that I've taken into everything that I've done since then. I mean, getting podcasts, getting guests on my podcast that I really want to interview. You know, I've interviewed some really awesome people like, like Shaq and Rob Deirdre, people like that you were talking about at the beginning that I've looked up to and, and, and respected for a long time. Um, but for every person that I've interviewed, there's three or four other people that I got rejected by or completely ignored by. You know, I've, we've had 800 episodes of my show, hundreds of interviews at this point. Um, you know, if, if we had 800 episodes, we probably had around 500 interviews. There's probably 2000 people that said no, or didn't, you know, respond, or I got ignored by if we've done 500 of them. And those ones hurt a lot more because like door to door, I'm knocking on some person's door. It's like, you know, they tell me to, to F off or, you know, get off their porch. It's like, eh, whatever. It's just some random person. But like when I'm reaching out to podcast guests, these are people that I respect and admire deeply. And I want to like have some of their time and connect with them. And then those people tell, you know, it's like, Ooh, those ones hurt a little bit more, you know? Uh, but it's all part of the game. It, it's all part of what you got to what, what you have to do. And when I was I raised capital for Guestio for my software company, which you know if you're building a software company, it's really difficult to do bootstrapping if unless you have a bunch of money already or or you have a partner that can build the software for you. I didn't have a bunch of money already. I didn't have a partner that could build the software, so I had to go go raise capital. When I raise capital, there's a lot of rejection that comes along with that. You know what I mean? There's rejection all the time. Like it's just part. It beats you down. And so if you don't have the, the fortitude to be able to move past that, you know, you're going to be stuck no matter what it is that you're doing. Yeah. I love that analogy with calluses, because the truth is that you're going to have rejection. You're going to have issues that come up in your life, regardless of whether or not you try to do something really difficult. Yeah. So you might as well go and try to do that difficult thing you've always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And um, the calluses make it easier, like playing guitar. I play guitar as well. Uh, the calluses make it much, much easier and tolerable. And, and they're there to help you. You may not realize that at first, but I love that. Um, my next question, given all the people that you've interviewed and, you know, the rapid growth um, of your show, by the way, you know, how many downloads are, are you at right now? That's a good question. Uh, either almost 3 million or over 3 million, somewhere, somewhere around there. Okay, so around 3 million. Um, you were just telling me when you were around six to 800. Was there a specific moment where you realized like, wow, this thing is going to be big or a specific day where there was a huge breakthrough? No, never. Frankly, like uh, the uh, podcasts are different than every other content channel in the fact that you're typically not going to have this like meteoric inflection point or crazy rise um, and, and like I said, it's possible, but it's, it's, it is not, um, duplicatable or predictable most of the time. Uh, it happens all the time on TikTok or YouTube or something where there's an algorithmic, um, force that's moving your content up depending on, you know, relation to their ideal market or whatever. Um, podcasting doesn't have that. So we would get, you know, increases based on guests or big shows that we had but always taper off after that and go reach a plateau down here the the big thing you want to look for in your podcast is if like you're looking at it over the course of the year is the trend up and to the right you know what i mean like is this plateau higher than the last plateau that we had um, and that's really what you're shooting for it's it's you're, you're gonna if you're looking for like that hockey stick level growth on a podcast it's just not going to happen like i said unless something big happens like unless you know you all of a sudden just got famous, like you blew up like an Andrew Tate or a Jay Shetty or these people that came out of nowhere and then all of a sudden were massive. It's not very predictable though. That's a good point. Um, I was thinking that uh, if it got shared, there could be large spikes, but you're right, TikTok, Instagram, whatever, that has way more virality than yeah. a podcast. So you've That's had your hard hat on this whole time, uh, you know, on the grind and it's paid off. Um, before we get to Guestio, just... Who are your favorite, maybe one, two, or three people that you've interviewed or been interviewed by? Other than me, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, easy number one for my favorite interview is Shaq. Uh, and it's not just because he's Shaq. It's because, like, I actually had, like, a really kind of deep personal desire to interview Shaq just because <clears throat> he was, like, a childhood hero of mine. I played a lot of basketball growing up, and Shaq was, like, my favorite player. <clears throat> and so I... 
had jerseys of Shaq, bobbleheads, like paintings, you know, basketball cards, all this stuff that was like Shaq memorabilia. And then now as a business person, uh, you know, like, like when I was transitioning into business, he was transitioning out of playing basketball and more into business, you know what I mean? So like, I've still followed his journey in that sense too. So um, that one, that one was a big one for me. Um, Rob Deerdeck was a lot of fun. You know, I don't know how many times I've watched ridiculousness over the years. Um, but, uh, but that, that was, that was a fun one. Uh, Molly Bloom was really cool. Um, after I saw the movie made about her life, I was like, I really want to interview her. That'd be really awesome. Um, so brought her on. Uh, you know, Grant was cool. There's a lot of, there's a lot of people, um, there on the people that I've interviewed side, people I've been interviewed by one of my favorites was bigger pockets. Um, just cause that was one, another one of those shows that I listened to from the beginnings a real estate investing show, the largest one out there, they get hundreds of thousands of downloads per episode, not even like total or per month. And, uh, it drove, drove a lot of, you know, great stuff for us in terms of, of business and recognition and things. But also just cool because it was like a full circle moment because I'd listened to it for so long. Same with Entrepreneur on Fire. Um, you know, there's a couple shows like that. There was like, I actually was a fan of these shows and now I'm being interviewed as a guest on them. So that was pretty cool. Now, when you made your podcast um, originally, was it a little bit different than it is now? Like, have you always stayed on the same topic or has it kind of shifted over time? It's funny to ask that we're actually rebranding it finally. Um, but it's called Build Your Network. It's been called Build Your Network since the beginning where we're rebranding it currently, like right now. So by the new year, it'll be a different name and we're kind of not change the topic. We're just broadening the scope of what we're talking about. So I'm a big fan of like when you're first getting started in podcasting, if nobody knows who you are, pick a niche, pick a lane, like make a name for yourself in a smaller pond. And then once you feel, if you feel like you want to leave that, then you, that's a better time to do it at that point to go to a really broad audience. But it's really difficult to tackle the broad audience thing from the very beginning if nobody knows who you are. So we were talking about networking, how to build better relationships, how to, um, um, how to get around the, the people that will help you level up in life and stuff like that. So that, that was what we talked about on the show for a really long time. Uh, the majority of them were interviews anyway. So a lot of the conversations you weren't really told, weren't really completely revolving around podcasting or I mean, uh, around networking. Um, but we would still talk about it. We'd touch on it. And that was still kind of like the major premise of the show at the beginning and, and up till recently. Yeah. That's awesome to just hear how that's grown and is continuing to grow. And, uh, now, uh, when I go into Office Depot in the future, I go there every couple of months. There's a little cardboard cutout of Shaq. So uh, I, I give him a high five every time I walk in, but <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, so transitioning to Guestio, when did you realize like, hey, I should probably make a software? Because me personally, I, that's something I'm actually considering as well when it comes to email marketing and deliverability. But a podcast software, I've never actually heard of that before until one or two years ago how did you realize that you needed it and that you were going to actually be the person to bring it to market yeah i wanted to start a software company because that's one of the great things about being a podcast host the things the paths that you can discover are incredible the people that i talk to like i got i got sneak peeks into so many different industries and business models and software was always the one that was like most intriguing to me uh, because of the infinite scalability and the leverage on your time and your employees time it's like if you scale an agency it's very people process heavy scale a software it's very product heavy and i thought that was better than the other way and so uh, i had no idea how to do it which is a completely different story but uh, i was i still thought it was kind of cool so i was looking actively to do something in software i just never really came up with an idea that i liked and then, uh, and then one day I was realizing myself trying to find guests on Cameo um, for my podcast. And I would use Cameo as this like celebrity shout out app. You can pay whatever Hulk Hogan say happy birthday to your dad. And I would use it to go in there and see if Hulk Hogan want to come on my show. The problem is, is that's not what the platform was built for. So I would reach out to people. I still paid the money to get in touch with them and they would say no. And then I was just out like two or $3,000. Um, I got one person to say yes from Cameo. The, all the other ones said uh, said no or just ignored me. Um, a couple of them refunded it, which I thought was nice, but uh, some of them didn't. So I just like paid the money. So I was like, man, if this actually existed for this purpose, I would use it. I would be a customer. And I personally know that a bunch of other people would be customers because they're in my coaching programs and my mastermind and course groups. So like, I know this is a problem that people are experiencing and I, I felt like I was, I, I, I felt, I felt like it was one of those things that if I didn't attempt it, I would always be like a, what if it would always be a question mark in my head? Like, what if that would have happened? Like, what, what, what could we have done if we did that? You know? 
Yeah, that's great. And to, you know, hear where it is today and to, uh, you know, work together where I'm your client and you're my client is cool because I get to see how this thing works. Yeah. And um, so for anybody listening, Guestio, you can get a $1 trial of Guestio. I'm not even like sponsoring this or anything, but it's just a cool software. And if I'm not mistaken, you even give people not just the access to connect with podcast hosts, but also templates. And like, what else do you provide with that $1 trial? Yeah, so for the dollar for the dollar trial, we uh, give you access to Guestio Pro, which means you can pitch up to fifty people on the platform, whether that's shows to be a guest on or that's guests to be a guest on your show. Um, you can pitch up to fifty people total every month. Um, there's a few other things like you can make your profile look better, you can do a custom URL and different things like that. Um, uh, but then on the other side, yeah, we, we give uh, like our perfect pitch template, which is the exact pitch that we use to represent people like Troy and all the other um, uh, multi-million dollar business owners uh, in, inside of our agency, as well as me, all the ones that I've sent out to get on shows or to get people on my show over the last few years. Um, we have crafted a, a template that works pretty well, and we give that to you as a part of the dollar trial. Um, we give you access to our mastermind group for free during the trial uh, period. So you can co-connect with some other people. Some people even get bookings out of just like joining the mastermind group without even going into Guestio or logging in the first time. Um, so yeah, there's some, some, some really cool stuff that we offer on that. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. And it just, it goes to show you, it's not even about podcasting. It's about connections because you couldn't even have this whole software. You couldn't have the done for you. You couldn't even have anybody talking about podcasts with each other if there was no network. And that's just a testament to what you've spent the last decade or so doing. Um, so that's incredible. And the done for you, which is what I'm in, because I am very focused on email marketing and trying to get my clients results and for my business, that Travis and Johanna on his team go out and they find a podcast for me to be on. So this uh, over the 12 months um, that I'm going to be working with them, they're going to find 45 podcasts for me. These are actually very high quality podcasts. Some of them are top 5%, some of them are top 0.5%. Um, so it's cream of the crop. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you, you've you built Guestio uh, between the software and the done for you? Like what are some of the things that you've done that have worked really well for growing your business? Yeah, on the agency side, man, it was just very much like we're meeting a need. Uh, there was just, there there were people, you know, in the masterminds that I'm in, high, just higher net worth friends of mine, people that are running million dollar businesses, multi-million, or um, we even have uh, one one uh, billion dollar company client that's, that works with us. People that are doing other things, they don't want to take their time to figure out how to go get booked on shows. They just want us to do it all for them. And so we had a few people that were like, hey, can you do that? And I said no, like for the first four or five people. And then after that, I was like, okay, well, I'm not in the business of turning away money. You know what I mean? Like I should probably stop saying no and just figure out what we can do for people. And so um, that's kind of just grown really organically, man, because uh, the software is kind of like the lead in point. People see what I'm up to. They see what I'm doing. They see what I talk about. And they're like, hey, I want that. What does that look like? And then they you know, end up coming on. And then it's kind of grown mostly through organic and referrals and things like that. Oh, we did have one funnel that was working pretty well to bring in some backend clients. It's since cooled off to cold traffic. Uh, we <clears throat> we decreased spend on it recently to like fix a couple of things, but it's essentially we offer a dollar trial of Guestio, and they go through a few different you know uh, sequences uh, throughout that funnel, and then at the very end of it on the thank you page we have a a video that says like hey if you know you're already running a business and you don't want to take the time to do it yourself you know apply here. And, uh, and we'll do it for you. And so we were, you know, getting good software users and people like that through the funnel. And then they would up, uh, ascend into our, uh, our backend agency work. Uh, so it was, you know, it, it ends up, it ends up working out really well. Cause it kind of just feeds itself. You know, it's, it allows us to be able to spend more money on ads and we're able to convert people at a higher ticket, uh, price point on the agency. Um, and, uh, and then allows us to go bring in more people into the software. Yeah, it's amazing, man. So keep it up. I am loving it personally. Um, I think I've been on about seven so far. Uh, not all of them are released yet, but even the same people you've mentioned, like I'm on Entrepreneurs on Fire. That's coming out very soon. Yeah. Um, and I'm excited about that one. So um, we started working together this summer uh, around the same time. Um, now, as far as email paramedic and email marketing, could you tell us a little bit about some of the things that like your situation before working with us and then maybe some of the results that you've gotten through uh, us running your email market. 
Yeah, dude. Um, I've always known email marketing is really important. I just, uh, I, I was always one of those people that it was like, what skills do I need to learn and what skills can I outsource? And to me, it was all, like, I was just, a, I was a sales guy first. So to me, it made more sense to focus on content and then focus on selling and then take the money from what I'm selling and go hire people who are better than I am at doing all these other things. So I have, I work with a media buying agency. I work with a funnel building agency and I work with an email marketing agency, which is you guys. Um, and so I just always look for the people who are really good at what they do and have them come in to help me out. Um, so before we hired you guys, I was just, you know, I think we're selling out, sending out like one broadcast email a week. It was very um, widespread. It was just like a single newsletter piece. It didn't really drive traffic to anything specifically. It was just because I was, I, I, before I, I literally didn't send anything like a year ago, I was building a list for uh, the, some of the podcast courses and stuff was never sending except for like the initial like product fulfillment, you know, sequences and stuff like that. There was no regular broadcasting going to that list and the list ended up dying. So this is a list that I had spent, you know, $300,000 to pull traffic on building. Um, and had we monetized that list appropriately, that business would probably still be around. It was just that I didn't have time to con to like uh, go back in, re-monetize that audience after I got the funding for Guestio. So we, I just, it was better for us just to shut it down and focus hundred percent on Guestio after we raised funding. Um, uh, and so it was a big lesson for me to learn that like, oh man, if I'm going to spend all this money acquiring leads on this list, I really need to make sure that we're keeping the relationship up because it's way more expensive to go acquire new leads than it is to just, you know, maintain existing leads and add value to them uh, throughout, you know, the life cycle. So uh, when we, when we started buying traffic again for Guestio, when we started turning stuff on and stuff was working well, it was like, I'm not doing that again. And I know I'm not going to be able to learn email marketing. And if I go try to hire someone to do email marketing for me, it's not going to be as good as going and finding an expert who does this for multiple people. And so uh, we met at hundred million group, brought you in. Um, and then I've been working uh, with Ian, uh, who's also here and, uh, and yeah, it's been going really well. Awesome. Uh, do you mind sharing how many trials or how many, you know, higher ticket clients you've closed um, through email since we've upped the game? You know, dude, Ian would probably know those numbers better than I would, to be honest. I, I don't I don't know exactly what it comes out to. Uh, but I, I do know it's the first time that we've ever had like revenue coming in from emails that we're sending that like didn't come through the initial, you know, funnel that we sent the traffic to. So just that by itself is something I'm happy with. And frankly, like just the daily broadcast emails, like the fact that my list is getting hit every single day with sometimes it's just straight value. Sometimes it's a podcast episode we put out. Sometimes there's a story that I shared something uh, somewhere else uh, that you guys take, pull and put into that, into the list. Um, you write it for my voice. Um, a lot of times it's even stuff that I've written. It's just that I've, I don't know, put out 800 episodes in my podcast. There's tons of content to pull from. So I always appreciate that you guys do the research, write it in a way that sounds like me. Um, and then, uh, and then you do it, you know, every day. So um, just the fact that relationships being continued to build is like the main reason that I did it. And then the fact that we're also being able to attribute revenue to it is even better. Um, so I, I really, I don't, I really don't know the actual numbers. To be honest. Gotcha. So in this case, we'll turn the light on Ian here. Um, for anybody who doesn't know Ian, like I mentioned, he came all the way from California early this year to uh, run lists like Travis's and he's crushing it. Ian, could you talk a little bit about some of the things that we've done to help grow Guestio and uh, a small glimpse into the results? Yeah, definitely. Um, so as far as the high ticket, um, that's something we're going to get to. I, I remember talking to Joanna and uh, I, I think we're going to like slow down on that until we get enough salespeople and then we're going to hit that really hard. But we did find a lot of success with your new uh, podcast guest, guesting secrets, the, the new offer you had a couple months ago. We did really well with that, that crushed. Um, and as far as the low ticket, it's kind of a no brainer and we've done pretty well on that end. But like Travis said, the real value here is that like Travis, people are getting to know Travis more now. And it's, it makes my job a hell of a lot easier that Travis has so much content everywhere. And the thing is, you know, I just, as a copywriter, I know how to kind of repurpose it and configure it in a way that's really compelling. And we, we're getting more replies from emails. And the thing is, we're just constantly reminding people of who Travis is and we're building that no like, and trust factor. And uh, Travis is a great client because I don't have to do a lot of digging and me and him, I mean, we're both from California, Lancaster's only a couple miles away and it's, you know, pretty easy to catch his voice. Um, I mean, 
And it's just been a great uh, relationship so far. But I'd really say the the real needle mover is the fact that we're emailing every day. People, they love Travis. They're replying to the emails. And they know that if there's one place that they're going to go for podcasting, it's going to be Travis. They're not going to try to find somewhere else. That's the thing with emails. When you're constantly showing value every day, you're telling great stories. Like the last week, I told a story about uh, when Travis ran 30 miles in one day for his birthday. And... You know, I think we got 20 replies to that email, which, you know, it's a pretty good amount of replies, but people love the story. They love getting a sneak peek into his life. Maybe they're not friends with him on Facebook, but um, yeah, that just means that when people do truly understand the value of podcasting and how it can help their business, guess who they're going to? They're going to Travis. So it's, it's been a really fun journey so far. Yeah, that's kind of similar to how I found Travis as well. Obviously, we met at 100 Million Mastermind, but when you meet at an event, there's just so many people there, and you're thinking, like, I can't even remember anybody's name. But uh, I looked up this guestio thing, I Googled it, and I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Um, and then it's like, you know, you exchange a Facebook friend request or follow somebody on Instagram and TikTok, and you keep watching the videos, or you listen to the podcast. And it, a lot of people just don't realize how valuable that is. So I think that um, obviously Travis does an amazing job of having content everywhere because that's his industry. And then, you know, we do our best to just portray that and take content and get it out there to the email list. So um, yeah, it's, it's been great so far. Um, now, Travis, like when did you get into like TikTok and Instagram and all those different platforms and really go hard at creating shorts and reels and uh, and TikToks? Like when did you start to realize that uh, you wanted to add that to podcasting. Um, yeah. So I think it's just because podcasting exists in such a separate world, you know, and, uh, people, people, it's funny cause you know, people will see, for instance, my YouTube, like I don't really do much on YouTube. I have like 1500 subscribers on my YouTube channel or something. And somebody will come up to my YouTube and be like, you know, they'll be like, Oh, well, Travis says he has all this, you know, podcast stuff, but you know, look at his YouTube. And it's like, well, podcast listeners aren't on YouTube. You know, my friend, one of my friends gets 15 million downloads a month on his podcast and he has like 24,000 subscribers on, on YouTube. Um, they just don't translate and podcast audiences don't translate across other platforms that well. Um, and so sometimes you got to put out content where people are seeing the results of the podcast without having to listen to the podcast itself. It, it could be a great lead into other episodes, of course, uh, but sometimes the consumers are just consuming differently. And so if you don't take the content and repurpose it to a platform where they're living, they're just never going to see it. They're never going to listen to it. They're never going to consume it. And so a podcast can be an um, excellent content engine. I was just listening to an interview with Mr. Beast the other day, who's, if you don't know him, the most popular YouTuber in the world, over 200 million subscribers across all of his channels, crazy story. Um, and, and he was on somebody else's podcast and he was talking about how right now is the best time to have a podcast because it's not just about the reach of the podcast itself. He was like, if this podcast gets 1 million downloads, it's like, that's, that's great. But clips from this podcast can be shared to YouTube and TikTok and all these other things. And they can be seen hundreds of millions of times over the next five years. Um, and it can live on forever. So he's like, podcasts are, you know, this, there's never been a better time to start a podcast. And I couldn't agree with him more because, uh, because of that same reason, you know, um, everybody, like everybody is uh, always told that they have to create content. It's so much more difficult to like press record and just create content than it is to just bring a friend on who has similar interests in a similar niche, like you and I are doing right now and have a conversation. Like we've been talking for what, close to 45 minutes right now, maybe at least 30. And, you know, the, the number of 30 to 60 second clips that can be pulled from this one interview would take two hours to sit there by yourself and film just to film it. But you, that's like assuming that you already did the prep work beforehand, you're scripting them, you're outlining them, you're doing something. Whereas this is like, we're pressing record. We're having a conversation. We can pull clips from this that'll live on other content channels that you can send to your email list or whatever. And then you also have the podcast that lives on the RSS feed that people are listening to on Castbox or Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever they listen to podcasts. So um, uh, it just makes sense to be on all the social platforms. And then uh, social platforms has something that podcasting doesn't, which is discoverability. Um, YouTube, I admittedly need to do better there. YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, they're all better for discoverability because people are searching for more things, more people to discover. Podcasts are really crappy for discoverability, like we kind of already talked about. So um, it, it can be a great way to 
post podcast clips and then have the call to action on the in the like the end cards and whatever on all the clips that you're doing be hey go listen to the podcast the link in bio is the link to your podcast like always drive people to pod to the podcast in my opinion a podcast is one of the best places to send people podcast and your email list are the two places that are the best places to send people because you own it right like youtube can shut your youtube channel down podcasting that doesn't happen because you own your RSS feed. And if Apple Podcasts shut you down, you can go to Spotify, you can go to CastBox, you can go to Podcast Addict, you can go to Stitcher, you can go to iHeartRadio, you can go like any other distribution platform you can be on. Um, so, uh, and then to me, it always drives the best relationship. Podcasting is the best place for building relationships with ideal customers and audience because of sheerly of the amount of time that you're spending with them. Imagine the amount of emails you'd have to read, the amount of Instagram posts you'd have to click through, the amount of TikTok, 30-second TikTok you have to watch to spend an hour with somebody right now. But if somebody's listened to this whole podcast episode, they've almost spent an hour with us. And 80% of podcast listeners listen to all or most of every episode that they listen to. So after they hit play, you have 80% of your listeners after they hit play for almost your entire episode. That's unprecedented. And it's the only platform that's still optimizing for that long form content consumption. So <clears throat> in my opinion, the relationship that you build with podcasting is so amazing. Email is better because you actually capture the information. So those are the two places I would send people from all the clips that you're, that you're promoting online. But you, you, I mean, if you're, if you're taking the time to do the, to do the content, you know, take the time to cut it up and share it uh, so that people know what, what it is you're doing. Like I know, I know of so many podcasts that I've never listened to a full episode of them, but I see their clips all the time and I follow them on social because I see their clips. You know that was saying? just a complete gold mine of podcasting knowledge right there. And a lot of people ask me too, they're like, Hey, how do you grow your list? And, uh, you know, preferably kind of quick and, uh, not super expensive. Um, so I tell them podcasts and doing affiliate promos with other people. And, uh, they basically talk about you to their list and the same can be done in podcasting and people listen for so long and they almost feel like they know you because a lot of listeners, they just, you know, they get to the point where they listen for an hour, they think you're cool, and then they want to come hang out. They, they almost want to come over. Um, and a lot of times they do. They join a high ticket program or uh, they stay in your community for a while, and a lot of lives are changed in the process. So that's if pretty cool. In, if I can chime in on that, actually, I think Travis brings up a great point. Like, I think that people, they're looking for deeper questions to be answered today, and they're not getting it from the traditional sources of media. And what they do is they, they log on just to conversations like we're having where people are like asking questions, talking about topics and digging so deep. And that's why, like Travis said, the 80% retention rate, that's super high. And that's what I try to tell in the emails too. It's like, this is, this is the new 10 o'clock news or whatever it is, you know, but it's extremely more deep. And like Troy said, you get to see the people's face and you like them a lot. So, yeah. It's as close as we can get to hanging out with somebody. It's 2022, everybody's on Zoom, but uh, you know, podcasts are the thing that people are now used to looking at each other and it's kind of what they want. Yeah. Um, so yeah, now Travis, um, let's say somebody wants to connect with you. Maybe they want to hire you. What should they do? Uh, yeah, travischapel.com. You can find all my social links and everything like that. If you know you just want to hire me, you just go to travis at travischapel.com, shoot me an email um, and, I'll, uh, and I'll respond. We'll jump on a call or something. Um, but if you want to check out Guestio, that's at guestio.com, G-U-E-S-T-I-O, like guest, be a guest, guestio.com. Uh, it's free to sign up for an account. You can check it out totally for free. Sign up for an account. Full disclosure, though, Ian will be emailing you to sign up for a, a pro trial uh, as soon as you sign up. Uh, but you can do it for free. You can browse for free. You can have a profile for free. You can accept any inbound requests for free. If you want to do outbound, though, you you uh, have to become a pro member of, of Guestio. So, um, yeah, guestio.com or travischapel.com, either one of those. It's awesome. You've got the freemium software down, and I can attest that the paid programs are even better. So, Travis, thank you so much for being on here. Ian, thank you as well for sharing some email marketing knowledge. And uh, we'll see everybody next time on the Secrets of Scale podcast. Appreciate it, man. Thanks. Thanks, guys.